Welcome to the Post Questionnaire. 35 questions giving us insight into what makes creative people tick. So today we are in the um, headquarters of this uh, organization, Global Citizen, in Soho in New York City to see the CEO. Uh, he was a friend of mine and who was the youngest Australian of the year several years ago. What an amazing person this this man is, Hugh Evans, activist. Um, and yeah, so tell us more about the, the organization that we're visiting today. So a lot of people know this organization, Global Citizen, which was really inspired by Hugh's visit to the Philippines when he was a teenager, where he saw the kind of poverty in which so many people live in. And he comes from Australia, one of the richest countries in the world. So he really dedicated himself to eradicating extreme poverty. The organization Global Citizen uses music and digital engagement to drive change. Okay, so with it, these big festivals? Big, huge festivals with celebrity artists who are truly committed to doing things. Some, Many of them have their own foundations mm -hmm. and who are using their kind of reach and clout and power to mobilize people to then put pressure on governments and organizations to make real commitments. It's hugely inspiring. It's, it's very clever also because it's engaging people with something they love, which is music, which mm -hmm. is transformative. And I know he now works also with different organizations that are trying to model his way of engaging, especially younger people, in effective policy changes. It's, you know, it's thrilling to see what he's done and just how huge his organization has become as well. Exactly. And he's sort of stays uh, incredibly humble because I think this is really somebody who doesn't work for himself, but works for a greater good. Yeah. And I think one of the things that struck me the most about our conversation with him and something I think that doesn't always come up, in fact, has maybe only come up with him among the people we've spoken to thus far, is a sort of a spiritual or a religious undercurrent that's very strong to what he does. So that was a, a neat discovery to make, because in downtown New York City, you don't always hear uh, people talking about about God and the importance of, of religious principles right. and tenets in their yeah. lives, and right. it, that's huge for him. I think we both left a little humbled. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I felt like I needed to go to church that weekend just to try to catch up a little bit in goodness, but that's impossible. That's right. So, okay, great. Well, looking forward to this one. So, um, <laughs> we'll start here. So, first of all, thank you, Hugh, for being on our podcast Are we already recording? today. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Lily. <laughs> Hi, Hugh. <laughs> all right, I'll get started today. Uh, first question, an easy one, maybe. What is your idea of perfect happiness? Well, I don't, I don't think I've ever experienced perfect happiness. Mm. I guess my idea of it is probably the idea of heaven, um, because I suspect that if you're in heaven, you would be in perfect happiness. Um, but I have n neither been to heaven um, nor have ever experienced it. So I, that's just my idea of it, not what... Um, and are you asking more, what is my ideal of it on earth? Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, that. I love that. You know, the, one of the things Uli and I have so enjoyed about this, doing this with, with different people is that the answers are so different. And it stands to reason that perfect happiness would be perfect. heaven. Yeah. So um, does that mean, are you living your life in such a way that you're hoping to get there? Is that a, like, I'm before you go to, to bed? Go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to me like you're a good candidate. But. Yeah, I have experience so much happiness because I don't really believe in heaven. So I better make sure I figure it out now. Right. Because I don't have that hope. That you I'll might be in trouble. <laughs> yeah. If yeah, you might be in trouble if you've been doing the wrong thing. But uh, perfect happiness is a high, a high I don't know if you can experience it on that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, fair enough. Well and then this is maybe the the inverse of this. Uh, what is your greatest fear? Oh I'd say that my greatest fear is not achieving my life's work um, because I've only ever really cared about one thing my whole life um, since I was super young is to try to see a world free from extreme poverty and I think that in the current political environment that feels much harder right now um, you know when I was growing up I uh, always thought of it as yes an imminent possibility but also you know you saw the virtues of of relative political stability and how that enabled a dialogue to lead to progress on many of the major challenges global health etc yeah 
where we're at right now in the world, where the world is by any stretch of the imagination more divided, um, you know, I, I know that we've said that we need to alleviate poverty by 2030. Mm -hmm. And the prospect of not achieving that within my lifetime is my greatest fear. Mm -hmm. um, because all the people I admire most did achieve their goals within their lifetime. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll, and we'll come back, I think, to the people you admire. Okay. What is the trait you most deplore in yourself? Wow. Um, probably fear of man. Um, I have been trying over the years to care less about what other people think mm -hmm. of both me and of, and of circumstance. I, I guess um, I don't know whether it comes from just the way you're brought up, but, you know, I, I do care about, you know, what other people think. But I also know that true, I think true, truly great leaders learn to not care as much. Mm -hmm. It's not just a thickness of skin, I think. It's probably, I think it's also just a, just a sheer confidence that you have to push through all the noise and the challenges of life to get to that outcome. And mm -hmm. so I, um, to the extent that I still, and I think I have gotten better over the years. I mm. think that's something that I do care less than I once did, um, but that I still care at all. I don't like that in myself. Mm. What is the trade you most deplore in others? Wow, this is really intense. <laughs> <laughs> you can just make something up. <laughs> no, it's good, right? It actually makes you think of. I, my immediate reaction of... was gossip. Huh. Like, just I, I don't huh. like gossip because I find it toxic and poisonous. Okay. I find that was just what came to my mind when mm. I, when I just yeah. first thought of it. It sounds so superficial, but I don't like it because okay. I think it just. I mean, you, it can be fun to the extent that it's not um, hurting people, but I think that so often it's not that way. And I think that I, I, I just don't like it. Right. Yeah. This next question may be interesting to hear from you since you're surrounded by so many people. Which living person do you most admire? Living. Yeah. Yeah, that's the hard one. Yeah. Um, living person. Hmm. I mean, the... There are, um, there, it's probably going to be someone I don't know particularly well, um, because, you know, um, so, and I, and I don't know this particular person very well, but one person that does come to mind that I do admire is Chancellor Angela Merkel, mm. because I think that, um, she has a, um, uh, a, a strength of character um, about her that man and has enabled her to navigate such vastly different political territory that as as the world has shaken around her she's managed to stay strong mm -hmm. um, and I know that her popularity has waned in recent years but that's kind of irrelevant because she's you know served the country the nation of Germany for so long now and indeed Europe for so long that, you know, like there's just few people in the whole world that even get to anywhere near that feat, mm -hmm. particularly in the current political environment. When people, oh, sure. when people change every oh, six, literally six in, weeks. In, in Australia, like they stopped making Madame Tussaud wax figures out of the politicians because they just weren't serving long enough. Like, and, and, and I think that yeah. for someone like her who... Right you know, had just incredible stickability in, in a very, very changing world and environment, I think you've got to admire that. Yeah. Um, there's something in her character that enabled her to, to and, and the wisdom to surround herself with the right people over such a long period of time mm -hmm. to achieve um, relative stability in the region. Mm -hmm. yeah. That... Um changing tax a little bit what is your greatest extravagance my greatest extravagance uh, well I um, I own a rowing machine 
Oh. Um, oh. Uh, That's a man after our own heart. We have one more row. We wrote there? crew in oh, college. Of yeah. Of course. <laughs> really? You own an erg? Yeah, every morning. I think that's punishment, I, actually. <laughs> I know. That's that's my idea of hell. But okay, but tell us about the. So have you always rowed or. No, no, no. My brother used to row in, in, in <laughs> high school, but um, I just found. I used to be a runner. And, um, and I used to run long distances all the time. It started when I lived in India when I was 15. But then as I got older, my legs started to kill. And the only way I could keep fit in was to have a rowing machine. Wow. So I bought a rowing machine. I love it. Do so you have a concept to yep. machine? Yeah. I do wow. in my basement. Wow. Um, and I love it. Oh. Wow. I think I remember every minute I've spent on those machines. Yeah. Oh, many, many minutes of my life. I have two now. Yeah. And I got one oh, first in college when I was at Cambridge and have had one ever since. And I love it. Great. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. How, how, how long do you <laughs> row in the morning every morning? Like what is your... 16 minutes. Okay. So yeah. 16 to 20. Yeah. So I'll do... Four, um, uh, so like every f um, every four minutes, I'll mm -hmm. do one kilometer, right. um, and so I can do five kilometers in twenty minutes. You can do five k. That's good. Yeah. That's a good pace. Yeah, that's yeah. like a one forty nine, one fifty. That's right. Uh, okay. Anyway, we're gonna stop. Right now. <laughs> but also, can I just say? I can see that. Let's say that Hugh Evans' greatest extravagance is a rowing Even machine. Rowing that is such a good. somehow such a that's wonderful right. uh, insight into you, your you, character. What's your What's your current state of mind right now? Urgency. Urgency. All right. Everything's urgency right now. Okay. Just because I've only got three hundred and sixty days to pull off. Like what is really a, a culmination of what we've been working on for the last 10 years. And so I yeah. like everything is focus and urgency right now in a good way. Not, not like urgency in a frenet in a frenetic way or just, just, I've just got to be super focused mm -hmm. at this point. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you consider the most overrated virtue? <laughs> That's a great question. Mm -hmm. The most overrated virtue I don't know. Um, it's funny because whenever I think of the virtues, I think of um, I think of like the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self control. And I think none of them are overrated. So I have to think of something else. Fair enough. Um, because I try to go through each of the virtues and think through probably, um, um, I don't know. Let me think. The most overrated virtue. What was your answer to that? Well, that's a good Mine question. was um, the tr telling the truth. Really? I think it doesn't always serve the purpose people think it does. I think it can actually not help. And I think this idea that saying what you know and think all the time is not really the best approach. Interesting. Yeah, I think there's something to be sort of, to be brutally honest. I think that's not actually helpful for how to live with other people sometimes. I don't yeah. remember what. Mine, I would say, and this maybe relates to what you were actually saying before about um, deploring in yourself that need to, to that concern for what other people might think of you. I, I thought popularity maybe in this day and age, like oh. how many friends do you have? How many likes? In a general it's societally sense. speaking, yeah. Not, certainly not a, a character trait that I would aspire to, but I think it's something that's very admired in our society now, and I don't think yeah. it's okay, necessarily then, a productive. Yeah. Then, then probably to that extent, then fame, I would say. Yeah, fame is, and it's considered a real. Yeah, I would say fame yeah. is the most overrated virtue because I think that it's actually often those people that are behind the scenes that end up accomplishing the most. Mm -hmm. um, the, I don't know if this is one of the questions further down, but one of the people, I'm, is there anything about the people you most admire in history? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll wait to that and then okay. I'll come back to it. Okay. So I'll say fame and then I'll explain right. why later. Oh, great. Um, on what occasion do you lie? Oh yeah, recently I know because <laughs> I sometimes get so, <laughs> you get not, conf not confused. <laughs> I, no, I, I, so I've been really trying very, very hard to become a vegetarian, 
<laughs> and but occasionally I love eating fish. Um. And so people say to me, are you vegetarian? And I go, yeah, I am. But I think it's more my aspiration to be a vegetarian <laughs> because I'm not yet fully. Occasionally I'll eat salmon. And I realize that makes me not a vegetarian. I'm a pescatarian. Yeah, that's not and, a vegetarian. And so, so I've been working really hard at it. Um, I, and then tap my wife voice goes, you, you're not a vegetarian, you're a pescatarian. Say you're a pescatarian. I'm like, but I want to be a vegetarian. <laughs> yeah, so that's your lie. <laughs> but well, if you keep saying it. After this interview, you can't do it anymore. I've been trying, I'm like almost down to zero fish, but occasionally a good crab cake is like so tasty. Oh, and then, yeah, yeah, I know. I'm yeah. on the pescatarian you side are. of things too, but you're right. And vegan. I mean, vegan. No, I, I never say, I never ever say I'm vegan because I love cheese. Yeah. And that's my big weakness. Yeah. Line in the sand. Yeah. Uh, which, maybe I'm a vegetarian is this word, phrase. Which word or phrase do you most overuse? Awesome or wonderful or like I do, I do have a tendency to, um, for hyperbole, but I, I use it because I do genuinely love the world and I love what happens in it and I get excited. I'm very excitable as a person and so I know I overuse those phrases. That's a great quality though. Yeah. I think. That's Especially so in this age when there's so much cynicism and irony to actually be a, be enthusiastic about the world. It's great. It's nice. Yeah. What or who is the greatest love of your life? Well, I'd say um, for me, my love my greatest love would be for God because it's always been my um, my understanding of myself in the context of the world and how small I am and uh, and how mighty um, the world and the creator is. I know we all have different perceptions of that and that reality and Uli, you said yourself you don't think there's a heaven, but but I. Uh, there may be a God, though. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, Different. and so the greatest of the greatest, which is yeah. the question, I'd have to say God. Yeah. yeah. Um, when and where were you happiest? When and where w were you happiest? Yeah. Do you have a specific memory or moment? I have. Well, the two memories that just popped into my head the moment you said that. One was very recent, and one was a long time ago. A long time ago when I was in 2003, I was living um, at a orphanage in KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa called God's Golden Acre for about a hundred children who were orphaned by HIV and AIDS. And I just loved working there. I uh, was able to, I had a, was setting up a sponsorship program for the kids um, that were at this orphanage. And I just remember being purely happy every day. I get to wake up, I literally ran woke up super early in the morning, go, went for a morning run, got to work every day, got to, I just was brilliant. And more recently, my brother and I have taken up surfing on the weekends. Um, he's been teaching me how to surf and on, we get up very early on Saturday mornings and go to the Rockaways and just mm -hmm. spend three hours in the water. And I feel so happy when we do that. <laughs> so those are the two things that came to my mind. Which talent would you most like to have? Which talent? Yeah. Oh. I, I think, um, I think it's leadership. Um, I think that's the talent I'd like to be much greater because as a, as our, as our own organization and the movement has grown, I've, I'm constantly reminded of my own, uh, flaws mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that there are only certain things that you can, I mean, obviously like everyone would love to sing and all that sort of stuff, but I'm, resol I'm resigned to the fact that I cannot sing and won't, won't sing, but I would love to be, love to continue to and become an extraordinary leader just in, a, in, in, the, uh, in the service of our mission. Hmm. Yeah. If you could change one thing about yourself, what would it be? Um, I mean, nothing comes to mind immediately. I'm pretty happy with who I am. I, uh, I don't feel, 
like there's no physical appearance things or there's nothing from a I already know my imperfections and I'm okay with them as well. So I don't think there's anything about myself. I mean, I'm sure there are many things that other people would say they should change about me. But <laughs> <laughs> That's not the question. We're not interviewing that. <laughs> um, what do you consider your greatest achievement? Um, I, again, I don't, I don't think we've achieved it yet. Um, I think that what I'd like our greatest achievement to be is to make a meaningful contribution to our to a world free from poverty. But I think we've still got so far to go because everything else is just an output towards an outcome. Mm -hmm. So like I can I can I get excited by the outputs. One output is that um, I remember in the early days of moving to New York City um, when we were trying to get Global Citizen Festival off the ground and even just to get the organization off the ground, everyone said, pretty much everyone laughed at us and said that it wasn't going to succeed. Wow. And um, I got this great email yesterday from someone who was reaching out to many of the original people who now support us massively, but in those days didn't believe in it. And I'm, I'm thrilled now, 10 years later, that the movement grew to became what it is today and the organization is what it is today. But all of that is, 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 as you know, just a proxy for a greater, a greater mm -hmm. outcome. Mm -hmm. And so the things that make me so excited is, um, again, individual cases, but a young kid that I met when I was 14 in the Philippines, Sunny Boy, I had the opportunity to go back to the Philippines and meet him and his life is better, I know, as a result of the partnership that we've built together. Um, he messages me every morning and, and I get to see how his life is slowly improving. It takes a long time. Um, I met a young kid in Peru a few months ago who's now back in school because of the work that Global Citizens did to get him and his school rebuilt. Mm -hmm. um, after the El Nino floods, I've seen kids in Malawi and Kenya who's who are back in school I've seen people who have access to vaccines and polio vaccines that are now alive and then that don't suffer from polio and that's all a proxy outcomes or outputs on the journey the real outcome is a day when no child will die for a lack of a 30 cent immunization where everyone would live in peace and prosperity and they wouldn't have to flee their homes mm -hmm. for fear of persecution or because of the effects of climate change or because frankly they're just too poor to be able to stay there anymore and live mm -hmm. live their own life and so until that day everything is is our, our outputs on that road to the greatest outcome yeah. um you if you were to die and come back as a person or a thing what would it be You well, reincarnated in some way. Yeah. <laughs> so let's say heaven is a way station to another. <laughs> right. <laughs> if you were to come back as a person or a thing. I mean, I guess not that it has any innate feeling, but it would be great to be the ocean or the air. Because... Um, I love that that's answer. Great. <laughs> that's great. Let's go, well, but why? It sounds good to me, but tell us why. Yeah, just because imagine if, if, if you were able to experience being the ocean or the air. <laughs> okay. Can I say that I said I want to be the sky and people thought it is so grandiose and oh, narcissistic. Yes. Yeah. And I thought the idea of the, you know, the sky and you contain all of that yeah. <laughs> and hold it all, it's beautiful, I think. Yeah. I actually love that. Yeah. <laughs> the ocean, look at that. The like ocean that. is really nice. great. It's a good one. Um, I, <laughs> Youssef Nabil, a, a photographer and artist um, I really admire and we interviewed recently, said that he would come back as a palm tree by the Nile. He's from Egypt. And oh, I wow. love that. Yeah. That also kind of put in my mind a smaller scale Amazing. fusion with nature, <laughs> uh, like a fish in the ocean. Um, where would you... Where would you Either that or a cool dolphin. <laughs> okay. A cool dolphin. Okay. Dolphin sounds great. Uh, where would you most like to live? Um, if, if work was no barrier, I'd love to live in Costa Rica because I um, went there on holiday once and I so fell in love with just the beauty of it. Just 
like uh, I don't know if you've ever been there, but no. the the coast up Costa Rica just has the most incredible surf, the most amazing. I mean, I don't know how like from a from a um, just a, a living how how I would afford to do so, but um, but as an idea, I'd love yeah. to the idea of, of living in Costa Rica. I just would love that. Yeah. What is your most treasured possession? Probably um, this ring that my mum gave me. Um, it's um, I, and I lost it once, but found it again. Um, my mum gave it to me before I went to live in India when I was 15. It um, says Mizpah on it, which is from uh, Genesis chapter 31, verse 49. And it, the idea was that when um, people sent their loved ones off to war in the First and Second World War, they would give them a Mizpah ring because it means may the Lord be between me and thee when we are apart one from another. And when I was 15... Or 14 just about to go off to India when I was living 15 my mum gave it to me and I've had it on my finger ever since except for that one moment when I lost it and um, so this is probably the most treasured possession how long did you lose it for only for only for a couple of weeks it's a long time yeah yeah well, yeah that's long enough to, to start to think that maybe it's not coming back yes. so yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you got it yeah. back um, oh this one's you Willie still Oh, what do you regard as the lowest depth of misery? Hmm. I'd say just just loneliness, um, sheer loneliness and isolation. I think that I believe that human beings want to be in relationship with one another and um, that whatever whatever form that takes it's different for everyone some people are um introverts some people are extroverts but for me not being in relationship um and feeling that sense of community is probably the lowest depth of misery yeah Right. This is one of those questions that Uli and I kind of try to parse because we like to attempt to be true to the original um, text of the Proust questionnaire, but it's oddly phrased. What is your favorite occupation? And I think what we've come to conclude is that could be just what do you enjoy doing the most to occupy yourself? Or what would your favorite occupation be if you could do something else entirely? So it's a very broad so question. When I, when I was a kid, I uh, wanted to be a lot of things. I um, I wanted to be a magician. Okay. I uh, <laughs> and I still kind of do. I think it's awesome. You on stage sometimes. You could just drive. I, no, 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 no. Trust me, I'm rubbish. Okay. I, I, went, I, went, I went to see I went to see Darren Brown the other day on Broadway. Oh wow! Genius, absolute genius. Um, so I wanted to be a magician. I wanted to be in a circus. I wanted to be a veterinarian. Um. Then I wanted to be a doctor, and then I ultimately trained as a lawyer. So, so as you can see... Your current job seems to combine some of these aspects. You are kind of a circus, circus. director. Yeah. You have all these acts coming up. Yeah. You have a big ring. Yeah. Right? Isn't that called you're, the you're, big top? Fact, you're producing miracles. You're pulling off you care impossible people. feats. You yeah. care about people and, and you negotiate really well. So, hey, yeah. it's good. A lot right. of these skills are in your yeah. current job description, right? Yeah. So it's <laughs> but for you, the trajectory... From, do you oh, yeah, and I also wanted yeah. to be a puppeteer. Like, I literally had the best puppet set as a kid. It was awesome. Like, I used to do puppet shows for my parents. Like, I even remember... <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. Like, like, I used to put on the most elaborate puppet shows for my family. And I used to love making haunted houses. They were the things. I just... Yeah. Do you still have the puppets? No. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody threw them away that while was, you were I think I was five or six. Okay. <laughs> I like this idea of you doing a puppet show. Yeah. It was a really good one we as well. Do, really? Yeah. We could do a video version of this. Actually. I know. Yeah. We, we know maybe if we graduate to visuals, we'll ask you to do. Or a card trick. We okay. take a card trick. Um, what is your most marked characteristic? So, And that's another one of these weirdly phrased ones. We think it means... What person? What personality trait do you have that you think people notice the most in you, or that comes out the most clearly or strongly when people 
meet you or, or even talk not to just you. personality, anything. What do oh, they see first? Yeah, what, what do, do they, they see first? first? Yeah, it could be I your haircut, but I, you know, I don't think that's your answer. So. I don't, I mean, I guess, I guess it's probably short and long term. I would say that over the long term, my most marked uh, trait is just perseverance. I think that um, I, I'm one of, I am a person that when I commit to something, I'm all in and I just don't give up. Um, so I think that's uh, probably at first glance, I have no idea. I'd, I'd have, I'd ask you Tolly, what do you think at first glance? Are you meant to be in this interview? Sure. Yes, that? absolutely. You what are, do you think Tolo? What first time you met you, what was your first impression? He was tall. No. And now after several years, he's persistent. He's the same height. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you have to cut that out. Uh, okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, we're giving that. Up. Okay. Uh, what do you most value in your friends? Loyalty. I think so because I think that um, I've been working with the same group of friends for the last fourteen years of my life. Like Simon, Mick, Way, literally the guys that we founded this organization with, like well before Global Citizen we were working together back in the days of Oak Tree and still my friends from, from high school, Richie, Rusty, Chris and Nick from Australia that I, I still count them as my, like, even though I, I barely get to see them anymore because we're on the opposite side of the planet. Um, I still think that I know we could pick up a conversation any day and it would feel like it's this it's just picking up a conversation of where we left off. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I think that's, that's, that's what I value the most. Yeah. Who are your favorite writers? Um, I, well, I, I, I guess he's not a writer, um, but the book that moved me so much growing up was Long Walk to Freedom by Mandela sure. because yeah. he was, I, I guess I love the, how, and, I, and I, it kind of shows me the world is much more forgiving than you realize because he had a really hard life, both personally as well as the extraordinary challenge of fighting against apartheid. You know, like so, so he, because he fought so hard for what he believed in, he, but he also made himself so vulnerable in helping you understand that actually his own journey personally was that so hard as well along the way. That, that was so inspiring to me. I read it, I remember reading it on the banks of this place called Shongwini Dam in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And afterwards I wrote him a letter that I have, uh, I'm pretty certain he never got, um, but it doesn't really matter. It was more just an expression of just my sheer admiration for him as a human being. Um, and so I think his writing was most inspiring. I do love reading autobiographies. I, I also, um, yeah, I find that autobiographies give me the most insights, but his was the best. Yeah. Do you have any heroes of fiction or film? So the question is, who is your hero of fiction? And we added film. TV. In like close time, there was no film, a film or TV release. So a, 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 a fictional, a fictional character. person who has inspired you, a hero. Um, no, I don't. Okay. I don't. No. no, not a fictional, not yeah. fictional characters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think they're super cool. Um, I mean, I mean, I mean I, I, there's a ton that I like. If the question was, which you know superhero would you like to right. be, I could give you ten ten yeah, answers. Yeah. But I don't admire them. Mm -hmm. I just think it's cool. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, who are some of those? No, you don't have to say all ten. But while we're here, well, I like um, I like a lot of the X Men series, mm -hmm. and I like um, I mean, I think anyone that has, you know a degree of omnipotence or omnipresence is super interesting because then... Back to the ocean. 
<laughs> Omnipotent and omnipresent. <laughs> because, because, and there are that many superheroes that have them, but those that do. Yeah. And um, persevering. That's yeah. the option too. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't stop. <laughs> okay, so the X-Men, yeah, I, I don't know as much about that, so I can't. But there is an X-Men, or there are X-Men who are omnipotent well, I mean, and they, omnipresent? They, they, there are ones that shape shift, and there are ones that can be invisible, and there are ones that can travel to multiple locations. But, yeah. So I think they're the coolest, because when... That's actually a question I always ask, like, what, what superpower would you have if you could only have one superpower? And everyone says, you know, I'd like to fly. I think that's cool, but... You know, if you could, if you could have all of them, then why wouldn't you choose the one that has all of them? Oh, right. right. Oh, I see. Like omnipotence just covers all of it. That's... I mean, you basically can have all the powers then. Right. Exactly. Why limit yourself to one <laughs> part of it? That's great. Oh, okay. And now we're back. This is you, Willie, a historical figure. Which historical figure do you most identify with? Uh, okay. So, admire or identify with? Because identify with, I don't know, but I can tell you who I'd most admire. The person I most admire in history is William Wilberforce. Um, he was a politician in the 1800s, who, for those of you who don't know, was um, working for the abolition of the slave trade in Britain. And his pastor at the time wrote the song Amazing Grace because, and there was a film made about him called Amazing Grace because. His pastor was a former slave trader who gave it all up and realized the complete error of his ways. And that's why he wrote the song Amazing Grace, because he said to save a wretch like me, as in someone so that would, that would engage in the slave trade. And Wilberforce, the reason why I most admire him is he didn't aspire for high political office. He just fought for what he believed in. And he put a bill for the abolition of the slave trade through British Parliament for 27 years and every year it got knocked back until literally three days before he died in 1833 finally the abolition of the slave trade act passed and um, he also incidentally set up the RSPCA which is the same as the ASPCA so his house was full of animals and um, so he had he had this motto in life he, he said, I have two goals. One is the abolition of the slave trade, and the second one is the reformation of manners. He obviously failed at the second one, but, uh, but, <laughs> but the, but the, the oh. first one, literally three days before he died, mm. was finally achieved. And so, so I like him because I do believe that often the strongest political characters are not the ones that are the front and center. Mm -hmm. They're often the ones that have the, the clarity of focus to know what they should and should not fight for. Yeah. yeah, who are your heroes in real life? I have a lot of people I look up to in real life. Um, I look up to our chairman, Chris Stadler. I think he's a very generous man mm -hmm. and uh, he sets a great example in his family and what they're doing philanthropically. He's one of those people who, yes, has really made it in terms of his own financial wealth, but has decided to set an example and give it away while he lives. Um, I think that there are, there in, increasingly, and this is something I've learned more in recent years, a lot of ultra high net worth individuals set up foundations, not to give their money away, but just to build big foundations, um, because they only have to give 5% away per annum legally, mm -hmm. and often they'll make 7 or 8% interest rate per annum, so they're actually giving nothing away. Um, they're just giving away a bit of interest and not even all the interest. Mm -hmm. Similarly, a lot of ultra high net worth individuals now set up donor advised funds and those donor advised funds in any given year, Fidelity themselves acknowledge that 95% of donor advised funds in any given year give nothing away. And so I think that the tax laws around the world have enabled those that have made extraordinary wealth not necessarily have to give it away. And I admire those that see with great wealth comes great responsibility. And so I admire um, Chris Stadler. I also um, admire a gentleman by the name of Anthony Farr. He was someone I first met in South Africa. We were, he, he, gave, he was a London banker and gave it all up to work at the orphanage that I was also working at in 2003. And he was my roommate at the time at the orphanage. He set up a charity called Starfish that, um, has became prolific across South Africa for mobilizing the South African um, 
working community to tackle the HIV AIDS crisis and um, was enormously successful in supporting orphaned and vulnerable children across South Africa. And then now he runs um, Alan Gray Orbis, is a huge financial investment firm in South Africa. They've set up a foundation to support young entrepreneurs. It's the largest um, black empowerment fund across South Africa, funding more entrepreneurs from more communities than any other financing mechanism on the continent. And he's managed it and, and t helped take it to scale. So I really admire him. Um, I guess I, I admire those that um, are super specific about what they want to accomplish, go after it, and 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 um, and deliver on it. Yeah. Um, what are your favorite names? I do love the name Charlotte. Um, I had a girlfriend once named Charlotte, and I just love that name. I heard a great name the other day that I love, um, Genesis. I think that's a beautiful name. <laughs> I never thought of that you could call someone Genesis, but I met a person named Genesis the other day and I thought, that's such a beautiful name. Um, and um, they're the two that came to mind. <laughs> <laughs> great. great. Uh, this is very general. What is it that you most dislike? What is it that I most dislike? I guess um, false hubris to disguise ignorance. Um, I think that's probably what I most dislike when you don't really have an informed view on something and yet you're willing to defend the absence thereof. Yeah. yeah. Um, what is your greatest regret? my greatest regret yeah I mean I think there are times in my own career where and I guess I guess you put it all down to learning where I again I guess it's probably partly because of my legal training I probably acted too legalistic in a situation when I should have had more grace um, and I think that as I've gotten older I've realized that Grace is always much stronger than legalism, despite no matter how good your training is. It's not always about being right. It's often about showing love and grace. And I think as I've gotten older, when I was a younger entrepreneur, I used to try to be right more. As I've gotten older, I realize it's less about being right. It's more about building community and showing love. And I think that my biggest regrets have all fallen from times when I let legalism and I think I've, I've, there are times when I've lost relationships because of it, like where I've, where I, I've gone, allowed my earlier quest to be right, to be stronger than my desire, well, at the time, my sensibility to realize actually you don't need to be right, you should just give it up. Yeah. Yeah, the Buddhists have a saying that you can either be happy or you can be right. And I try to keep that one in mind when I'm really angry that I'm in the right. You know, it's like, okay, if I gave this up, I'd be happier. Uh, um, how would you like to die? I, I mean, ideally, in a way that, 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 that um, I guess, is surrounded by loved ones. I'd love to be, I'd love to die surrounded by people I love and... Um, and they love me. Um, what is your motto? My motto came to me from my, something my brother gave me. He, he said to me as a kid, he said, always live dangerously, love lavishly, serve humbly. A, a combination of risk, living dangerously, loving lavishly, showing grace, and serving humbly, I more and more I'm convinced and it's almost the more global citizen grows and the more we have success the more I'm reminded it's not about any one of us but it's about all of us and there's such a tendency in society particularly right now because the cult of the personality is stronger now than ever and there is always a tendency to believe that your own goodness or your own skills manage to get you here and I realized actually that's not true. You know, there's so many circumstantial factors and community factors that have enabled us to succeed um, that, that aren't really tied to anything I could have done or not done. 
And so um, live dangerously, love lavishly, serve humbly. All right, this is the one that we've added and we'll conclude with this one. Who would you most like to hear doing this podcast? Like if you could choose anyone, again, probably alive is helpful for us, but <laughs> anyone alive today, who would you most be interested to hear answering these particular questions? Well, I mean, I, someone who I think would have very thoughtful answers would be Chris Anderson. He's one of our board members. He runs TED. Mm -hmm. um, right, yeah. And he's, he's, a really, he's a really thoughtful man. I, uh, I, I think he's a wonderful, wonderful guy, really thinks deeply, cause, and I guess that's how he, like, Ted became what it is today, in mm -hmm. that they, he forces himself to, th to think deeply about many of the social challenges, but also just the way society operates. So I'd love to see what he thinks of these questions and how he interprets them. Um, we want to thank you, Hugh, and especially since you said your current state of mind is urgency because you have a lot of work to do. Um, but we're full of admiration, actually, that you sort of, you this persistence and that you're doing it. And then um, we're just really grateful that you joined us today. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. It was really such a privilege. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. Great. Thanks.